Good evening. I'm Bob Hauser, Executive Officer of the American Philosophical Society, held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge. That's its real name. <laughs> Welcome to the opening keynote of the Society's Spring Symposium, Open Data, Reuse, Redistribution, and Risk. Before proceeding further, I want to recognize a few people uh, who have helped to organize this. Adriana, who's hiding behind her mask in a PC back there. Adriana Link, uh, Director of Scholarly Programs, and Kyle Roberts, who's not hiding uh, uh, there, and is the uh, uh, director of the assistant director, associate director of the library for all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then you were greeted out there by a couple of people who I guess have not made it in yet, in case there are late comers, but uh, Maggie Hoot and, and Nathan Kinsey. The American Philosophical Society resides in what is now known as Philadelphia, which is in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, the real people. And their relationships and connections with the land continue to this day and will continue into the future. In recognizing this, the society expresses its thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of the Lenape, as well as that of numerous other indigenous communities and individuals throughout this continent who have offered guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. Their generosity makes the work of the society's library and museum possible. I suggested that before lowering the screen, we would leave the, the uh, portraits up there of uh, people who I expect all of you can name. Uh, and I would note the fact that aside from their uh, brilliance in helping to create this society, they were all slaveholders. Uh, and we recognize that and other aspects of racism in the history of this society the society is now committed to a future of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, which we call the APS IDEA. For those of you joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Ben Franklin in 1743 for promoting useful knowledge. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over a million and a half dollars a year in research grants and fellowships, primarily to the younger scholars who need that kind of support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. You can check our website, www.amphilsoch.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. This evening's program marks the start of the Library and Museum Spring Symposium on Open Data, which is inspired by the work of the Center for Di Digital Scholarship and particularly its Open Data Initiative. Under this initiative, the Center for Di Digital Scholarship works to identify content in the APS Library and Museum that's conducive to being reconfigured as machine-readable data. To encourage the use and reuse of the data by opening them to all and by facilitating access to them. These data are in turn made available to anyone and everyone to evaluate, share, reuse, and remix as they wish under the APS open access policy and are ideal resources for use in college classrooms and in digital humanities projects like mapping and textual analysis. By, <clears throat> by way of example, Benjamin Franklin's postal records from the mid-18th century were deemed of no historical interest by Yale's project to create the Franklin Papers. The APS Open Data Project transcribed and entered the data, which have provided new information about colonial correspondence networks and the participants in them. 
Among other data, the project has created data on admissions to the Eastern State Penitentiary in the mid-19th century, on James Madison's meteorological observations late in the 18th century, and on indentures in Philadelphia, but there are others. Following this evening's keynote, the symposium will continue tomorrow, June 3rd, with a day of discussions, and the full program may be found on the Society's website. The proceedings are also being live streamed, and we invite those of you attending remotely to participate in the conversations on the Society's social media using the hashtag number sign capital A P S capital O P E N that is open capital data 2022. APS Open Data 2022, and by submitting your questions using BoxCast. The theme of this sub symposium is of special interest to me, for its contributions to the digital humanities complement my own efforts back in the days before I became a recovered academic, recovering academic, uh, to produce public data for the social and economic sciences. Among those were creation of public use samples from the 1940 and 1950 U.S. censuses, a standardized collection of annual school enrollment data from October current population surveys, and extensively documented public use data from the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, which has followed the life course of some 10,000 Wisconsin high school graduates and their siblings for the past 65 years. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Miriam Posner. Dr. Posner is an assistant professor at the UCLA Department of Information Studies. She's a digital humanist with interest in labor, race, feminism, and the history and philosophy of data. As a digital humanist, she's particularly interested in the epistemological questions that arise from the conjunction of data and the humanities. She's at work now about, on a book about how multinational corporations make use of data in their supply chains under contract with Yale University Press. The title of Professor Posner's keynote lecture is Data Trouble. <laughs> so, Dr. Posner. Thank you so much. It's it's wow. It's such an honor to be here and stand next to uh, these these you know lofty gentlemen is is very exciting for me. Um, thank you thank you so much for making the time to be here and um, you know give an hour to this. I know it means a lot, but it's uh, it's really wonderful to see people in person. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, and special thanks, of course, to Adriana and Kyle and Nathan and Maggie. Thank you so much for making this happen. I know it's a, it's a big undertaking, and we're all very fortunate to be here. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about um, kind of a foundational issue, I think, that will interest us hopefully all over the course of the next couple of days, um, and namely that's whether that there is a specifically humanist way of working with data. Um, and that's something I've been thinking about for a long time, um, prompted by a bunch of just little observations in the course of working in academia. For example, um, if you've watched data management librarians talk to humanists about backing up their data, you may have noticed that it can seem like they're speaking different languages. Um, the librarians, you know, often insist that these scholars have data, while these scholars in turn tell the librarians that they have no idea what they're talking about um, because they, they actually do not have data. That's not something that we have. Um, and I've seen it over and over again, um, this distinct hesitation, um, even hostility to calling humanity sources data and it's a bit puzzling 
in some ways because it's not as though humanists reject the notion of data outright. Um, like most humanists probably wouldn't have a problem believing that global climate change exists based on climate data. Or um, I can't imagine a humanities scholar saying that we shouldn't look at poverty rates expressed as data. Uh, the problem seems very particular and it seems to raise itself especially when someone proposes to treat humanity sources as data. That's where we get itchy. Um, and of course, well, I don't say of course, you may remember uh, evidence of this in this piece um, from Stephen Marsh, his notorious 2012 essay for the Los Angeles Review of Books, uh, Literature is Not Data. Um, and if you prefer data to support this, uh, we can find it in a 2015 survey of faculty at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which, quote, revealed weak identification with the word data, particularly among faculty at the College of Liberal, Liberal Arts. Um, and the author writes, in this case, many faculty preferred the term, quote, research materials. So I had fun um, looking at this graph, um, which is probably a little difficult for you to read. I'll point some things out. Um, Thank you, by the way, to Alicia Moore at the University of Minnesota for sharing this data with me. So all of the um, orange segments of these bars uh, reflect faculty members who chose to call their research materials data, and the blue ones uh, are faculty members who preferred to call them research materials. So the very tallest one, the very tall orange bar is psychology, um, which is almost all data, just a little bit of research materials whereas you know, the tallest blue bar is the English department. So none of the English professors wanted to call their materials data. Um, uh, you know, the, the next tallest orange bar is probably sociology over there. Let me know if you want to examine this graph more closely. I find it just really interesting. I mean, I, in a way, it confirms something that I had suspected, but it was nice to see it expressed as data. So this all got me thinking, like, if humanists tend not to think of their sources as data, why is that? Like, what's the, what's the reason for that? Um, and so maybe it would be helpful to look at a definition of data like this one from the National Academy of Sciences. So um, in essence, uh, the National Academy of Science says, quote, data are facts, numbers, letters, and symbols that describe an object, idea, condition, situation, or other factors. To me, it doesn't seem like that really gets us anywhere, um, since according to this definition, there's no particular reason, like I don't see why a humanities source can't be data under this definition. Um, like a book, for example, could be said to describe an object, idea, condition, situation, or other factors. So maybe we need a little bit more nuance. My, my colleague at UCLA, uh, Johanna Drucker, argues in humanities approaches to graphic display that we should actually reject the word data, whose Latin root means what is given, in favor of the word capta, to reflect that what we've been calling data, these spreadsheets and, and data points, is simply what we're able to capture from the world, so capta rather than data. Um, which I think is, is a wonderful point. But then I find myself wanting to extend this distinction so that we can understand exactly what makes CAPTA CAPTA as opposed to um, just stuff or research materials. I have another colleague, Chris Borgman, who provides a useful definition in her book, Big Data, Little Data, No Data, noting that the right question to ask, I think this is a very good point, is not what is data, but when is data? And, and by this, she means the dataness of like a set of materials does not inhere in any qualities of the materials themselves, but in the way that the scholar intends to use them. So data becomes data when it's used as data, she says, which I think is, uh, as I said, a wonderful point, but I think we can pick up where she leaves off if we wanna really understand this problem. So if anything, as Borgman says, has the potential to be data, what then is the distinction in use that marks a set of sources as data or not data? So if the right question to ask is when is data, 
then like wh what, what is happening to the materials to make them data? So, okay, so what exactly is the source of this humanist unease with data-driven work trained on the human cultural record? And is it worth taking seriously? Should we ignore people who say they don't have data if they're humanists or, or should we look a little closer? Well, obviously, since this is like 40 minute long talk, I'm gonna say we should look a little closer. Um, and while we investigate this, I think it's helpful to have an example of data that humanists have pretty uniformly rejected. And I happen to have an example right here. Um, I don't know if, if you remember this um, article in Science along with the accompanying kind of media blitz for what uh, the authors of this piece call culturomics. So um, they've taken like the entire corpus of Google Books and uh, performed various kinds of keyword searches on it to generate insights that they claim can touch on a, an enormous number of humanities fields, linguistics, cultural studies, religion, feminism, everything, um, because you know, they've, they've, they've solved culture for us. Um, so, and here's an example of uh, the kind of work that they present in their article in Science. Um, so, these, these uh, figures are actually mislabeled, interestingly, but, but uh, Article C, or, or Figure D, uh, claims that in the battle of the sexes, the women are gaining ground on the men, which you can tell because the relative keywords for men and women are like converging and then changing places. Uh, and then in figure C, we can see that feminism was more vital uh, in France early on, but then the United States proved to be, quote, a more fertile environment in the long run because the word feminism was used much more frequently uh, post-1950. So, um, so this stuff made a really big splash, but I don't know of any humanist who responded very warmly to this kind of thing. Uh, like it was intriguing, but it's, it didn't create a whole new field like the um, authors thought it would. Um, there's no field, there's no department of culturomics anywhere. And in fact, they've all gone on to do other things like work for Palantir, interestingly. Um, so, so, so the question I have here is like, what bothers us about stuff like this? putting aside the fact that they're way out of their, uh, their playing field, <laughs> they're, they're entering into territory that really they're not qualified to do. But, 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 but beyond that, like what bothers us about arguments like this that draw on data in this very instrumental way? I mean, I think one of the first answers that springs to mind for a lot of people is positivism by which we, I think we mean that big data projects like culturomics consider only those phenomena that can be recorded empirically and then dismiss all speculation or interpretation. So that is to say the culturomics team has naively mistaken recorded data for reality. And I, I do think there's a good measure of that here. Uh, but I don't think that accounts for the entirety of, of the problem. Uh, the scientists involved in this project are pretty clear that they intend this work to be a starting point for interpretation, not the end product. Um, they say uh, interpretation remains essential, and the question is, are you willing to examine this data? Uh, no, <laughs> no. It turns out we are we are not willing to do that. Um, I, I don't know of any humanist who's actually used this work as a starting point, except for a critique. And in any case, you know, humanists of most stripes tend to believe that some kind of ground truth exists somewhere. It's the rare humanist that believes that absolutely everything is relative, although of course they do exist. We use evidence all the time, and we certainly believe that evidence can prove an argument wrong or right, because otherwise we wouldn't spend so much time in archives. So we believe there is some truth supported by evidence. It's just that the culturomics data was clearly the wrong evidence for us. So maybe it's something else. Uh, maybe it's close reading, uh, by which I mean carefully interpreting smaller pieces of evidence in order to make arguments. 
Um, and people often raise this fondness for close reading as a possible reason that humanists haven't fully trusted big data projects. And again, I think it, that is an important. It's like it's really important to, to note that some of the methods uh, don't translate. But again, not the entire issue. Um, because close reading has never been the only tool humanists use. We piece things together. We work in archives. We provide context. We look at the long durée. We do a lot of different things with evidence. So a preference for close reading and this aversion to positivism are certainly important, but I don't think that they tell the whole story. The real problem, I think, lies with some fundamental assumptions that get activated as soon as you start treating a source as data. So in, in what follows, I'm gonna lay out what I think those assumptions are, and you can see if you agree or wanna argue with me. Uh, so the first one is demarcation. So when you, when you treat a source as data, the boundaries of each record must be demarcated in some way. Information cannot exist as an undifferentiated mass if we're going to perform computational operations on it, even if you perform those operations by hand. And yet, humanists tend not to see events, objects, or even people as cleanly disconnected from one another, at least not in a reliable way. So one of the culturomics diagrams gave us information about the dates on which the telephone, radio, and other media were invented. Well, you know, if you, if you wanna get technical, the very word invention tends to make historians squirm because it suggests that objects are cut cleanly from whole cloth. They weren't here, and then they were here. But we see individual technologies as emerging from constellations of forces, not as suddenly appearing like thunderbolts the way they do in this diagram. And, you know, further, in fact, we tend not to think of various pieces of technology as separate in and of themselves. Um, the notion of remediation, for example, uh, suggests that previous technologies are always built into the technologies that succeed them in the way, for example, cinema swallowed vaudeville and television swallowed many of the attributes of cinema and so on. So these things are not really separate, they're all connected. Or to give you another example, a database my students and I worked on uh, a few years ago required me to create separate fields for films, screenwriters, photographers, and directors, which works really well if you're looking at you know, the golden age of Hollywood cinema, but that same separation of roles doesn't really hold true for the early silent era when we were uh, investigating, because a lot of times the director was not even like a thing that existed, and yet somehow these roles needed to be separated and followed over time. It was very confusing. Uh, and if you're thinking about text analysis, I would say that perhaps tokenization is another form of demarcation. Uh, I imagine that we're all familiar, well, maybe some of us are familiar with the argument that you can't understand a work of prose as a bag of words. The way that the words connect to each other uh, matters, too. So there's a closely related issue I wanted to mention as well, and that has to do with whether one data point can sensibly be measured against another. So like, when is it okay to say that one thing is equivalent to another thing or precedes another thing or outweighs another thing? Uh, we need some sort of standard scale of measurement. Um, and Johanna Drucker calls this process parameterization. So to give one example, we know when we think about the way that we experience our lives that time doesn't operate the same way for everyone at all moments. Um, like when you're experiencing something really uncomfortable, time seems to go on forever, while this talk, on the other hand, is just flashing before your eyes because it's so incredibly enjoyable. Just hoping I'll never stop talking. <laughs> so we register time in many different ways. Um, but in order to place it on a scale, we need to come up with standardized measurements to apply to it. And I think that this feels strange to people who are interested in the particularity of human experience because it seems to deny that different people can experience the same thing in different ways. And, uh, you know, in a way we can see some of this 
uh, weirdness in action with this project, Digital Harlem, uh, which is you know, a pioneering project um, that claims to display the everyday lives of people who lived in Harlem in the 1930s. And in, in a way it does, but on the other hand, for whom does a card game occupy the same register of experience as the murder of a spouse? So the two experiences are not equivalent in any way, and yet they have to be made to fit the same order of thing if they're going to be jointly displayed on a map. Um, so the term ontology, as you probably know, can mean many different things. Um, in philosophy, it often refers to like the basic essence of something, um, while in computer science and information science, ontology refers to the way that you've organized entities in order to create some kind of data model. But I actually like this confusing aspect of the word. I've never been able to figure out like what exactly the etymology is um, or the reason for its divided paths in different disciplines. But I like it anyway because I think it gets at an important aspect of the term, which is that the way we divide the world into categories does express something fundamental about the way that we see the world. And one person's ontology often won't make sense for another person's. Um, databases, on the other hand, are designed to stabilize relationships, even if just for a moment, because otherwise we can't retrieve information with them. They need to have some predictable set of relationships. But when humanists think about the way things are connected to each other, they're trained to be really attentive to the way that these connections change depending on who's doing the looking. Um, and, and one example of the way that this is played out in the real world is the case of indigenous communities making their cultural materials retrievable in libraries and archives. Um, most cultural institutions, um, you know, if, if they're following Library of Congress guidelines, will classify indigenous artifacts under the single heading of antiquities which makes perfect sense if you're a colonial administrator, but if you're a member of an indigenous community, uh, your stuff is very much not unique, or antique, excuse me. Um, this is just a quote from this interview that I liked. Um, Kelly Webster says, have you ever noticed how American Indians are treated in Library of Congress cataloging? In both obvious and subtle ways, American Indians are treated as a remnant of the past. So in response to this kind of, um, you know, ontological marginalization, I guess. Um, we've seen a good number of alternate classification schemas arising from indigenous communities. Uh, the Brian Deere classification system is probably the best known of these, but there are many uh, which are fascinating to look at. So ontology is sort of, you know, it's the ground you walk on or the air you breathe. It's, it's these basic assumptions you make about how you should understand the world. And scientists have many disputes about many things, but they also tend to have a shared understanding of the terms of the debate. Um, you might think of astronomers who can argue about many different things, but generally agree that there is one sky <laughs> where stars appear. Humanists, on the other hand, love to change the terms of the debate. It's our specialty. Um, and it's not just because we are sneaky, although, they're, you know, there's some ego gratification in it, I think, but, but because actually we do think it's important uh, if you're representing human culture to understand that not every human experiences the world in the same way. So standardized models of the world do sometimes become very troublesome in this context. So hearkening back to our poor, hardworking data management librarian, um, in the sciences, it's become really important for repositories to collect not just scientific studies, but the underlying data as well. So that, of course, scientists can replicate experiments um, and check their veracity. And it's one great benefit of well-structured and described data, this ability to independently verify results. But I would argue that this logic is close to unintelligible for many humanities scholars, at least when, when applied to their own work. And that's why I saw librarians and humanists in these standoffs um, where neither could make sense of what the other was saying. Because generally we would never expect two different people to look at the same like book, for example, and come to the same conclusion about what it means, ever. Like it's not that the interpretation is personal, although of course it is in a way, so much as 
that the interpretation is the work. It's very rare that someone disputes that you in fact saw the thing you said you saw, like in the archive, uh, although it does happen, but just that you were wrong in the meaning that you ascribed to the thing that you saw. So the very idea that one person's research might replicate another's suggests to the humanities scholar that the person asking us to replicate our work uh, in some fundamental way doesn't understand it. If you're a historian or a cultural scholar, you bring to your work the knowledge that history contains a plenitude that is impossible to replicate. That's like um, day one of History 101. We cannot know everything that happened in the past because the historical record is so partial and incomplete. And, and over the years, the decades, the centuries, we've come up with ways of dealing with that necessary incompleteness in humanities scholarships. So we, we can talk about gaps in the archive, the contingencies of the historical record, the voices that tend not to be recorded. There are at least rhetorical ways to gesture toward, toward those excisions or gaps. But data, I think, has a way of reifying itself. We don't have a programmatic or visual vocabulary for talking about what's not in a data set. And so to a historian, a data set sometimes seems to boast of a definitiveness it cannot claim. Even if the data set is explicitly a sample, it purports to be representative, right? Because otherwise, like, what would be the point of having it? A data set is necessarily bounded. Otherwise, like Borges's map, a data set would sprawl beyond even our own advanced ability to manage it. But historical phenomena aren't bounded in that way. Um, and, and here I think of uh, Sadia Hartman's book, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, um, where she writes, I've pressed at the limits of the case file and the document, speculated about what might have been, imagined the things whispered in dark bedrooms, and amplified moments of withholding, escape, and possibility, moments when the vision and dreams of the wayward seemed possible. Um, to me, this is a beautiful evocation of what you do when you're filling in the gaps in the archive, right? You, like if you, res if, you, if you relied only on what was there without making these interpretive leaps, it would be a very impoverished history that you're able to write. Um, and as of yet, I don't think that there is a vocabulary for doing that with data. It seems to violate something critical about what data does. Um, so historian, historical and cultural artifacts rarely pre present themselves in isolation. Rather, they're bound up with a format and context that itself carries meaning. Um, for example, uh, this advertisement for an early African-American silent film contains information about the cast of the film, which happened to be what my students and I were hunting for. But, of course, that's not all the ad contains. The pictures, the language, the paper it was printed on, even the way the newspaper has crumbled over the years, all of these things matter too. And yet, to assimilate data points into a coherent whole, one has to remove the, quote, data from its distracting context. So denuded in this way, so for example, just extracting the cast information, that data means something, but it doesn't mean the same thing it used to. And no scholar, let's, you know, to be realistic, of course could capture every aspect of resource material in a scholarly work. But in examining example after example of this source material in context, the scholar does, I think, hope to notice something that others wouldn't have thought to record that would never have been recorded, in fact, as data because no one thought it was important. So a data set, in a way, looks naked to a humanities scholar. So noteworthy features are there, of course, but humanities scholarship is built on drawing our attention to things we'd never thought to notice, the, the crumbling paper, for example. So I, th I think that all of the operations that I've just mentioned are performed under the sign of categorization, which is what I want to argue is at the heart of this humanistic refusal to embrace data. 
Categorization, I think, is at the very essence of any attempt to create data. You know, the world, as, as we know too well, uh, as it exists, is a cacophony of phenomena, none of which is inherently categorized in any particular way. And in order to turn this mess into computable data, we need to identify those parts of any object or phenomenon that are meaningful and then give labels to those attributes. That's, in essence, what you do when you make a data set. For example, I could be classified as a woman, a scholar, a digital humanist, a mother, or any number of other things, depending on what you're interested in. The label we pick depends on the kind of thing we're interested in counting. And we do have to standardize these labels in order for them to be at all meaningful. So like I may want to call myself a woman with an A, you may like woman with a Y, but if we want to capture if we want to perhaps claim that there's some essence of womanhood that, that should be formed in some kind of category, we need to standardize our labels. Now, that's not to say you couldn't have synonyms, but you know, in that case, you're still boiling two subtly different things into one, one category. But we have to do that. Like, if we don't categorize, we can't count or query. And if we can't count or query, we can't visualize or, or make any of the other arguments we love to make. And this is true of any kind of database, I would argue. Um, linked data schemas, for example, generally have URIs for male, female, and gender not known. So that's kind of an interesting example of labeling. We, we tend to believe, moving through the world, that gender is fluid and contradictory and multivalent. But DBpedia, unbeknownst to most people, has a single authority page for male or female where this stuff is non-negotiable. It's interesting. Um, I thought about this uh, when I watched this YouTube video. Let's see if I can escape out of here and show you the uh, video I was thinking of. Um, this is Jeffrey Marsh talking about um, gender categories on YouTube. I'll just play you a few minutes of it. Hello. Is there a way we could play sound from here? I am Ready? <laughs> If not, it's not a big deal. Jeffrey Mar Okay. Well, I, I can move on. I think, you know. If, if you're curious, I do encourage you to, to look at this. I mean, not, not because it's like a singular work of genius, but because he says something that I think we've heard before and, and have come to believe, which is that you don't necessarily have to choose what your gender is. You can exist in a gender fluid state. So he says, you, you don't have to choose. Oh, McAfee. Okay. <laughs> always where you don't want him. Uh, so Marsh says we don't have to choose, but um, data in, in a way says we do. You know, we do have to choose. Now you can have a project like Homosaurus, which is an incredibly kind of compendious encyclopedia, encyclopedic um, set of authorities for different gender identities. But even in, in that case, you're, you, you see how you're kind of um, cutting things down very finely to a certain extent. And, and, and in doing so, you're eliminating the possibility that things might coexist or exist as the same thing or, um, or might exist in two different places at the same time. But again, um, if we're going to work with data in any meaningful way, we have to do stuff like that. Um, we have to create authorities for gender and race because we need to be able to aggregate and disaggregate data in order to make it anything other than a whole bunch of cells in a table. It would be incoherent if we didn't try to categorize. I think, you know, in a certain way, what the culturomics guys didn't understand is that good humanities scholarship doesn't take existing categories as its raw material. The whole point of it is to break existing categories by making these new and unexpected con connections. 
and the most powerful humanities scholarship, I think like the kind that blew your mind as an undergrad or that you always wanna teach to your students, is that which breaks those categories that seem absolutely the most natural to us. So natural that it wouldn't even occur to us to question them. Things like man or woman, black or white, human, not human. We use evidence, definitely, but to build, I think, these new ontological frameworks, not for the most part to fill in gaps in a timeline. And I think that's why the culturomic stuff seems strange to us, because it assumes that these categories, which are the very thing that we're trying to question in, in a very real way, have some kind of salience across time and space. It's a display of technical virtuosity that's actually completely irrelevant to what we're concerned about. Um, so this is all probably sounding very data negative, but no, I am data positive. Um, I actually find data fascinating and work with it a lot. It's just that I think that, um, that perhaps we need to acknowledge that the problem is more interesting and tricky than we thought it was. Um, that we need to think of different methods for working and communicating with data. And I should say that uh, my sense, speaking to people who specialize in database design, is they actually understand these challenges uh, to representing information and feel them as keenly or, or more keenly than we do, because they're in there in the trenches trying to make sense of these categories. But the question still remains, like, what do we do? Do we build ever more detailed data models uh, like our Borgesian map? Or do we develop perhaps new conventions to express some of this complexity without trying to recreate it? Um, and, and over the years as I've thought, and thought about this and thought about approaches, I have in fact found some approaches to working with data that seem to me to have a great deal of potential for a humanistic approach to working with data. Um, in my mind, it turns out that communities outside of mainstream data science have developed these um, sophisticated forms of knowledge about data, and that perhaps um, lifting up and listening to what some of these communities have said uh, could help us all. Which makes sense when you think about it, because if data structures or ontologies are built with a person like you in mind, you don't need to think about them. Like, why would you? You fit the form. Um, but if you've encountered friction with ontologies, then you've had occasion to think about it. Like my gender doesn't fit here, or my race doesn't fit here. Uh, and as we'll see, as a result, in a lot of cases, people have developed very useful strategies for working with data, for recognizing its use, while also kind of challenging its um, comprehensive authority. Um, a few years ago, I got interested in um, working with some Maori information professionals on the Maori subject headings, which are an alternative system for classifying objects. Um, this system was devised by a group of Maori information professionals. Um, and the Maori classification system, you know, like the one I mentioned earlier, was designed to accommodate Maori knowledge in the archive, which of course isn't organized according to the same principles as Western knowledge. For example, the Library of Congress subject headings categorize a spacecraft as a subcategory of rocketry, which is a subcategory of aeronautics, which is a subcategory of communication and traffic, which works in a certain way. Um, but the Maori subject headings list a spaceship as a subcategory of waka, which can mean canoe, but also you know, a conveyance in general and much more than that, since the Maori, as you might know, are legendary navigators um, who, who see the ocean in a very different way than Eurocentric models do. So that's what a waka atea is, according to Maori knowledge. It's a, it's a canoe for the stars. Um, but you know what particularly interested me about these subject headings were the way they were encoded. They have to be made interoperable with Library of Congress subject headings, so they're encoded as nested structures, as XML, um, even though Maori knowledge doesn't necessarily work that way. So the guiding metaphor in the Maori working group is tukutuku, that's actually the name of the, the data schema, which is, tukutuku is a kind of weaving, um, and the idea is that one person stands on one side of the loom and the other person stands on the other, 
and the process of making Maori knowledge fit North American colonial knowledge structures is a form of push-pull, uh, a back and forth between what made the most sense for Maori epistemology and what made the most sense for the system that had to accommodate this knowledge, just like people stand on two different sides of a loom kind of building meaning or art together. Uh, so what I really find useful is the sophistication with which the Maori community is thinking about data. Um, they understand that data is useful and telling in certain ways and can certainly be of practical utility, but they also believe that knowledge resides somewhere else, in this case, in traditional Maori modes of knowledge. Um, and in this model, so data is invited in as a participant to the dialogue, but never with more authority than the community itself. Uh, and there's, a, there's another model, you know, one of, one of a lot, one of many, that I find really provocative and inspiring um, from a group of thinkers who are associated with this emerging field of black code studies. Uh, I've listed some people's names, although there are many more. Um, you know, Shaka McLaughlin, Trustee Cottom, Jesse, Jessica Marie Johnson, Simone Brown, and many others. Um, what these thinkers have tended to recognize is the way in McLaughlin's words, black people and black queer people in particular are quote, hailed by big data in the sense of being pathologized and criminalized by it, but also depend on being able to wield data in order to demonstrate, for example, you know, the ongoing effects of housing discrimination or wealth disparities. Um, the artist and data scientist Mimi Onuoha has compiled missing data sets, such as the people denied public housing due to criminal records or the number of trans people killed or injured in hate crimes. I think Onuoha is asking us to consider how much data exists to criminalize and condemn marginalized communities. And yet, even in this avalanche of data, these glaring blank spots prevent us from uh, speaking truth to power. It isn't, so she's not saying we don't need data. She's saying that we need to interrogate what we've imagined data to be for. Um, and Jessica Marie Johnson uh, laid this out in an article in Social Text, um, where she discusses the twin origins of slavery and data and calls on us to recognize that data is never neutral. She says, adjust atten attention to the dead, I argue, requires digital humanists to learn from black freedom struggles and radical coalition building that offer new models for social justice, accessibility, and inclusion. Uh, so again, I think Johnson, McLaughlin, and others are looking at and, and lifting up black data epistemologies as um, sophisticated approaches that um, even very distinguished statisticians, some of them don't have access to. Recently, the information studies scholar Roderick Crooks and Morgan Curry elaborated on this ambivalence of minoritized community to data. And they argue that activists from these communities have learned to adopt what Crooks and Curry call a quote, agonistic approach to data. So when they use this term, I think they mean that minoritized groups use data to make arguments and mobilize collective action. So they do use data, but they also recognize that data has the potential to create great harm to system-impacted communities. So this is an understanding that's shared, uh, that, that doesn't seem to be shared uh, kind of universally in, in our culture. Uh, and I think that these approaches to handling data's relationship to reality um, show a depth of understanding and a reflexive skepticism that isn't in evidence in a lot of mainstream discussions about data. They understand and assume immediately that no matter how good your data is, it's not going to capture everything. Um, and they've developed modes of working with and building from that essential mismatch. Um, so I'm kind of a tourist here. I'm, I'm, I've been you know, watching and learning from um, these emerging fields, which I think are tremendously exciting. And I think we can all benefit actually from recognizing that these ways of working with data are sophisticated and nuanced and 
that it's useful actually to lift up and elevate the scholars who are practicing them um, because in fact they've done some, some really impressive and, and impressively useful thinking about this. Um, and um, I, I sort of am watching the development of the field with a lot of uh, enthusiasm and excitement and will be you know, participating tomorrow with enthusiasm and excitement because I think that you know, acknowledging issues with working with data doesn't mean that we shouldn't. It just means that it's a lot more interesting and complicated and frustrating and fun maybe than we've given it credit for. Um, and I hope that you might think so too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, that was fantastic. Um, so we have a little bit of time for questions that folks have. And uh, we also have uh, many people watching on Facebook and BoxCast. So Adriana, if you want to just raise your hand when you've got a question. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I mean, I might start us off. I mean, there's a lot, I think, that's going to help us get through oh, to kind of really think about over the next day. And maybe this is uh, one that you're not going to have an answer for, but, um, but might help us think, you know, what are the sort of structural impediments mm. to embracing those three very promising mm -hmm. alternative modes mm -hmm. of approaching data are there, and I guess, are you sort of optimistic or have we built the resource base and, and maybe the, the training fields <laughs> for this in a way that, that work against um, a true sort of humanistic rethinking of data? Mm, that's a really good question. Yeah, that gets kind of to the heart of things, doesn't it? Um, you know, I, I've, Gone back and forth. I mean, I, I do think that we don't really necessarily yet have the vocabulary and the like set of tools that we need to be working with data in this particular nuanced way. Um, and then the question is like, what does nuance look like? Um, there's one option, which is to kind of document everything in, in finer and finer detail. Uh, the other option I've, I've been thinking about is one, you know, um, that comes from my background in film studies. Uh, so, like, you, you, in, in a way, data is like a documentary or, or a film in the sense that, like, it's trying to show you something real, but it has to be selective, just like, like a documentary or a film has to be selective. And um, the solution that film uh, or at least some camps of filmmakers have come up with to that problem of honoring reality while also necessarily being selective is to develop a set of like formal practices that gesture toward plenitude and contingency while at the same time acknowledging that like they can't fit all of that in the frame. Um, so I think that there are ways of rhetorically and visually gesturing towards a kind of incompleteness and plenitude that 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 don't that that cannot exist in what we have and that might be a small thing you know ways of showing that like the boundaries are are porous but uh, it could be very useful for us all as we like think about what an infographic means Uh, thank you very much for this uh, amazing talk. I have so many questions, and I'm happy that I'll have plenty of time to talk to you later. Um, so I agree with everything that you say about categorization, and I just kind of want to um, push you. No, I don't want to push you. I agree. Um, one, two words I didn't hear necessarily as often as I thought that I might have were language and culture, uh, which I think are at play in everything that you're talking about. And if you asked, like, my background is in German studies, and if you asked me, well, what do we study? What is our object of study? I would say language and culture, which, of course, are these two master terms that we actually can't do very much with. But to me, it seems like categorization is, in some ways, in tension with language and culture. It's enforcing its own sort of logic upon language and culture, which doesn't play well with it. And some of the most poignant examples you have are actually instances in, with, in which language and culture are, are uh, at odds with categorization. For example, your example with women, with woman, which way do I spell it? Mm -hmm. 
Well, rhetorically, those two things are very different, but we have to pick one. We know they're the same concept. Maybe they're not. I don't know. We could argue about that. Or your example with um, the spacecraft being a subcategory of canoe. So uh, I know I'm putting like huge terms on you, but I just sort of wanted to, to maybe get you to be a little explicit about what's, what's going on here with language and culture, and where do you see those two terms fitting into this? Mm, yeah, Ooh, yeah, those are big, but t yeah, totally worth thinking about um, and trying to talk through. Well, I think that like what you say is true, actually, that there are like really fundamental ways in which language and culture are not compatible. Like they just can't be expressed on a spreadsheet or, or you know, a graph database or whatever you want to use, um, no matter how sophisticated the instrument. Um, the fact that ontologies can change on the fly in language and culture is just a capacity that I, I, I don't see how a database could have that. So what I was sort of ramblingly trying to get to in, in I think my last, answer too is that perhaps the more reasonable approach to that problem is to acknowledge it and then develop some kind of rhetorical or visual vocabulary for acknowledging the mismatch. Perhaps that makes more sense than trying to come up with like the, the ontology that matches every use case. Uh, but I, I'm also curious to know like how you would answer your own question. <laughs> well, I guess... Um I almost feel like categorization imposes its own language and culture on what we're trying to do, which is going to be at odds with whatever type of source material we have. If you think about tokenization, for example, you know, uh, a common response to a tokenization project would be like, well, you, you're, you're looking at how people are using reason in the 18th century, but that word doesn't mean the same thing right. for Goethe and for Kant. Correct. You know, it doesn't mean the same thing in Germany as it does in the United States. Um, and so, but by trying to categorize it, in some ways I'm overriding both language and culture and having to come up with something that actually is a third thing or its own language, or it's imposing our dominant U.S. American language and culture on the past or on something else. So I don't know how I would answer my own question, but I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I just want to, well, what, what, what I kind of wanted to get on the table with my question was how categorization is uh, not, I think this is the, the thrust of your talk. It's not neutral. Mm -hmm. It is operating within the, the dominant cultural linguistic norms of the society. And that is at odds with what we do as humanists, but nonetheless it's important to engage with. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, just even on a, on a, on a simple level, like sitting down and making a list of the categories you're working with and imposing that discipline on yourself can be incredibly illuminating uh, because just like everybody, we all have biases and, and ideas about the way that things should work that don't become explicit until they're expressed sometimes as categories. Yeah, I have a, a couple of comments uh, to offer. Um, one has to do with the way in which language and culture affect what are nominally positivist mm -hmm. uh, uh, categorizations and I can offer you several examples of that one is the term Hispanic which has been used to categorize people and the US Census and related uh, measurement schemes officially mm -hmm. since the 1970s it's an invented term mm -hmm. the Bureau of people the staff of the Bureau of the Census thought that the former term that was used, Spanish surname, hmm. was obsolete. And so three or four guys sat around the table and tossed around words until they came up with Hispanic. And they said, okay, we'll use that. I didn't know that. Um, 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 I, I will add another one, which is more politically fraught, as well as involving language and culture. I once was at a, at a meeting in, of people from the... Office of Management and Budget discussing the um, categorization of race and ethnicity more broadly in official statistics in the United States. And there were people there from Fiji who wanted to be, rec mm -hmm. be recognized as Fijians. There were people there from Arab countries who wanted to be characterized as Arabs. And there was one major ethnic group in the United States that did not want to be measured at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
that's Jews. Mm -hmm. um, so language and culture really impinge on these things that are nominally um, uh, uh, positivist. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that I wanted to say is to offer an example of what I would regard as entirely appropriate um, digital humanist uh, inquiry that, that produced a, a clear finding 59 years ago. And that was when Fred Mosteller and David Wallace looked at word counts mm. in the Federalist Papers mm. and determined a set of conclusions that 175 years of, I'll say, humanistic scholarship had failed to obtain, namely, who wrote which of the Federalist Papers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's the hope, right? That, like, I, that's what, that's, that's what, and if you look at, like, the early kind of rhetoric about digital humanities as it institutionalized itself, the claim was that we'd get those kinds of insights, like, regularly from, you know, these new technological methods we had. And in a way, this project comes out of, like, an interest in the fact that, like, that hasn't happened the way that we thought it would. Like, it's not as though, it's not as though, like, there are really important names in digital humanities, but you don't need to name check them in, like, your orals list if you're not studying digital humanities the way that you need to name check, you know, Harold Bloom or, you know, any other number of, of you know, kind of linchpin scholars. Yeah, my, my attitude about these things is taken from the Mikado, the punishment, let the punishment fit the crime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, well said. Adriana, do we have some questions from the online audience? Yeah, so, ooh, I'm very loud. Uh, shout out from the internet. Uh, we're still alive. Uh, so on BoxCast, former APS curatorial fellow Aaron Holmes had a question about um, how generational divides shape um, understandings about uh, the difference between humanities and, and sort of the, the graph you showed about research and, and data. And I'm wondering maybe to build on that, if you find divisions when working with your students about what counts as, as research and what counts as data. Yes, yeah, such a good question. By the way, I have a friend who's an elementary school teacher who calls her students roomies and zoomies. So hello to zoomies. I think that's really cute. So hi zoomies, hi roomies. Um, yes, in fact, like a big chunk of this paper that I like mercifully cut out for tonight had to do with like, what is humanities anyway? Um, and the fact is that like there's no real good definition. Uh, and just as you said, and, and just as we've come to expect from cultural artifacts, the meaning of humanities has changed a great deal over time. So, you know, in, in the olden days, uh, humanities was, uh, was the humanities because it was not religion. Like you had two things you could study. You could study like the Bible or everything else. And humanities was everything else. And it wasn't until like the Cold War that it became the case that humanity started to refer to like not sciences. So that's when we, we, we get C.P. Snow and the two cultures. Um, and still to this day, there is not a single definition of the humanities that is not circular in, in my experience. And so what I've, what I've come to believe is that like the, the most useful way to think about it is like a community of practice. Like, a set of people who um, work on a, on a shared understanding of a problem with very like craggy and ragged boundary edges, but who from time to time uh, share a concern with, with uh, a controversial boundary object such as data. So in a way it's like the way that we're talking about data right now that's forcing us to figure out like what exactly we are. Um, because if we don't have something special to offer, then, like, why not culturomics? You know what I mean? Like, if we can't say what it is that we do that's different, then why can't um, the Google guys just solve our problems for us? Um, so that, you know, that's part of the reason I think it's important to, like, come to a better definition. Um, about generations, yes, I don't know what your experience is, but I found it extraordinarily hard to express to undergrads like what a humanities question is. 
Like, what is the difference between like a sociology question and a humanities question? And I always resort to things like, it's more open-ended, or like, you know, you have to interpret. Um, and and they, have, they have a terribly hard time articulating um, a question that I would recognize as a humanist. And perhaps that's because um, I wasn't trained as like a STEM person, so my thinking was conditioned in another way. Um, perhaps it's generational too. I mean, perhaps there's a, a certain like instrumentalist way that we've been encouraging people to think about like social change and, and meaning. Um, I don't really think it's generational. That seems too, that seems too um, judgmental and probably not accurate. But, um, but I have noticed how hard it is to talk about. Unmil uh, Karadkar. So this is a really fascinating topic. Thank you so much. And this negotiation of data as a boundary object, the term that you last used to describe it, is really interesting. And it reminded me of a few other similar negotiations that I have either studied or lived through. Uh, and then this happens inevitably. And eventually, you find a point of compromise. And it seems like in digital humanities and data, we haven't quite found that point of compromise. I just had two or three examples of where they have found such points of compromise with some people clearly being disaffected. Uh, one was in the computer human interaction community in the 1980s. There were the psychologists trying to find, fight the computer scientists. And clearly, there was some subsection of these that still coexist and have the CHI uh, ACM conference today. Mm -hmm. Others drifted off to their corners. In the early 90s, the hypertext community went through a similar thing where there were the liter uh, literary hypertext people mm -hmm. who had a pitched battle with the structural hypertext people. Ah. Right? And clearly, the structural hypertext people won. And today's ACM hi uh, hypertext conference is, is mostly structural in form. And you don't see that much literature in it. But, but the early um, proceedings were really interesting from the literature side of it, too. In the late 90s, there was the digital humanities, uh, the digital libraries community, mm -hmm. where Chris Borgman was on the, uh, on, on the vocal in terms of including the librarians and libraries as services mm -hmm. on the digital side of things. And then there were people on the other side who were thinking of libraries as, as infrastructure and as AI but not so much as a service at all. Mm. And then it seems to me like digital humanities and data, or humanities working with data are coming slowly to that negotiation. And I'm just wondering whether this reflection seems at all relevant or if there are other examples of communities that have uh, grappled through these questions and emerged successfully. Oh, yes, well, what's so, so good. What a good question. I mean, I'm thinking of like the discipline I was trained in, film, you know, I was very specifically in a film studies program because like film was celluloid on 35 millimeter and nothing else counted. And, you know, then came video and, and digital and we had to like fight it out and figure <laughs> out like, okay, what does count now as film? And, you know, we came to a consensus just as you, just as you describe these other communities doing. So it's, it's, I'm always interested, like thinking, like, are we coming co to a consensus now, perhaps, either as humanists or as digital humanists, in a very kind of impressionistic way? I, I think that, like, perhaps we're achieving an equilibrium by splitting off from each other a little bit more. For example, you're seeing a lot of talk about something new, computational humanities, which is a term like deliberately devised to describe like the more you know, computationally sophisticated programming work that's happening, uh, you know, in, in the literary studies world in particular. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, so I think that, like, perhaps what would help us achieve a, a better equilibrium or, you know, comfort or productivity or you know, usefulness would be, I do think that it comes down to like just being honest about these epistemological tensions. Like we, we perhaps have to acknowledge them to each other um, and then talk about them like grown-ups. Hi, um, 
Yeah, thanks so much. That was that was really fascinating. I I appreciated your attempts to <laughs> define why humanities scholars are a little bit uncomfortable with calling their material data. But I I was thinking as I was reflecting on your talk, I was thinking about some of the historical questions mm -hmm. behind modern categorizations of even what is social science versus what is humanities and how arbitrary it is. So at UCLA, where I did my PhD and where you teach, the history department is in the social studies um, uh, <laughs> unit, not in the humanities, whereas where I teach at the University of Maryland, it's in the humanities unit, and, and there's a weird balance that happens as a result of this rather arbitrary categorization. Um, and there's really good books that have traced the, um, the separation of sociology and anthropology, for example, from history, a political science even from history. In a way, it's like people who are a little bit more happy-go-lucky in terms of how we make con con connections are, are, um, are being separated out into one group, whereas those who want more rigorous understanding of the science of how you know, history works, <laughs> if you will, or politics works, have ended up in political science. So in other words, partly the, I would argue the, the um, current architecture of the university is actually reflecting longer term divisions uh, about what you're talking about, which is, which is really pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. which, all of which brings me back to my question, which is how does power fit into what you have described? Because in a way you've got all these abstract categories about which I agree with. I mean, we're much more interested in what are the connections, what's missing, and that's a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. But um, what can we find that helps us understand, you know, more? But there are power structures behind a lot of what you're talking about, not just that example. But I was thinking of your Library of Congress example, with, which, if I remember right, Thomas Jefferson was the one who came up with a system of organizing his books in his library, and that became the basis for Library of Congress categorization. And, you know, it's based in a particular mindset from the 18th century and the Enlightenment, right? I mean, I might be misremembering something, um, but um, I think that's the basis, right, isn't it? As far as I know, I'm, I'm not an expert on the origin. Well, but just um, thinking about that power structure compared to the Maori power structure you're talking about, like there's, it seems to me like power is a valence here that's kind of silent in terms of creating some of the background organizational mm -hmm. structures that humanists are fighting against but also trying to reveal at the same time. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, no, it does. I, I think that um, perhaps I should have been more explicit about it. I mean, I think that like a necessary precondition to uh, resisting some of those power, like colonial power or patriarchal power or even class power or economic power, uh, involves being able to to, to say that like these structures are, are, are themselves inequitable. So it's not just like the distribution of values among the data set that's the problem, it's the entire kind of ontology of the data set that's the problem. So unless we're able to do that and authorized to do that and recognized as a discipline that has the moral authority to do that, then our ability to um, push against power structures becomes very, very attenuated. So, um, so I do think that like that's one of the values of being able to switch ontologies is being able to um, switch from one point of view to another. I mean, from from you know the point of view of the hegemony to the point of view of you know someone working from the margins. I mean, that's the whole. I don't know. I guess that's the reason I'm interested in it. Um, because because categories always mean power. Well, I think that's a fantastic moment for us to wrap up on and a, a question that we won't uh, solve this evening, but will power us through our conversations tomorrow. So please join me in a round of applause for Miriam. Thank you.